This video is brought to you by Sporlin, quality, integrity, and tradition. All right, this morning, we are gonna be working on their beer walking. So, I've been here a couple times in the last couple weeks working on other things, and I noticed this compressor is making a ridiculously bad noise. It has oil, but that noise that it's making is not normal. There's a bearing issue or something's going on inside that compressor. So, we are gonna get it replaced today. I've got a technician, another technician, picking it up from the supply house. And then uh, we're gonna get it swapped out. Now this thing's never really been worked on. Uh, they've had for been very fortunate. I think we've like de-iced the evaporator coils, but we've, I don't think we've ever done any refrigerant or related issues or anything like that, so. Since this guy's still running, you know, we can go about it kind of different. So what I'm gonna do is we are gonna go ahead, well, we could, but what we theoretically could do is front seat this valve, the discharge service valve, and we could front seat the suction service valve. If you front seat those completely, what you do is you stop the flow of refrigerant from this part of the system, down and down. And it isolates just the compressor. Then what you could do is recover the gas from these ports just out of the compressor, and you can do a swap on the compressor because this compressor has rotolock valves. You can literally just pull the rotolocks off. But, these rotolock valves are in real, well this one right here is in really bad shape and it's got a lot of pitting and corrosion going on. I'd really like to go ahead and replace that valve. So I gotta kinda think about this and decide if that's what I wanna do. We definitely are gonna have to replace the liquid line filter dryer. We'll put a new sight glass on it. But how we go about this, if I want, what I could do is just recover the entire charge from the system, swap out the compressor, be done with it, pull a proper evacuation. If I wanted to be quick about it, I could just front seat these and bust off the rotolock valves. But looking at this guy, I mean, that nut is really corroded too. So I really think that we should just go ahead and recover the charge. If we recover the charge completely from the system, it would be really easy to change the dual pressure control. Now, I say that, you know, the compressor itself, when it's pumping down, it's running too low and I've diagnosed this before, this dual pressure control is, it has a drift to it. And that does happen over time where you set it at something, but over time it goes out of calibration and it no longer shuts it off when it's supposed to. Uh, this is an original dual pressure control. We've pretty much changed every other dual pressure control. You can tell because the sticker, okay? None of those have stickers on them. So every other one in this rack has been replaced except for this one. I'm gonna go ahead, I think, and just do this right. So we're gonna recover the charge from the unit, change the dual pressure control, change the rotor lock valve. We're just gonna do it right. It's gonna be easier that way because then we don't gotta fiddle around. Now, if we were to just front seat the king valves, what you could do is recover the charge from in the compressor, swap out the compressor, pull a vacuum on it, open up the king valve, start the system up, and then pump it down at the liquid line receiver and swap out the filter dryer. And then that way you don't have to remove all the refrigerant. That's a possibility too. But if we do a pump down like that, it doesn't allow us to change the, uh, the pressure control. So we are getting ready to recover the refrigerant out of the system. You see that receiver? That's a big receiver. So we're gonna have to use a 50 pound recovery cylinder, but this tank does not hold 50 pounds of refrigerant, okay? I, you know, I don't know why they call it a 50 pound cylinder. It is what it is. Maybe in the R12 days, it could hold 50 pounds of 12, but that's not the case anymore. You have to figure out the density of the refrigerant. You have to figure out the uh, tear weight, which is the, the tank weight um, empty. And then you have to figure out the water column weight. And with the density of the refrigerant, the tear weight, the water column, you input those numbers into a calculation and it'll give you the amount of refrigerant you can put, and you have to put the max temp that it's gonna be stored in, too. It's a lot of work, and it's really easy if you use the HVAC School app that Brian Orr made. I'll show you guys a little screenshot of me using that app really quick. I got no affiliation other than Brian's a friend, and it's a great free resource on the internet.
I shown this a million times. I'm getting ready to recover, okay? But I need to purge. So we need to purge here. Ooh, and that, there's, look at that. Nasty oil through the system. Okay, we purge there, and we also need to purge at this tank. So what we do is we open this guy, and I leave this loose so we can purge out all the air. See? And then now we're ready to recover. So we can go ahead and open this guy up. Actually, I gotta zero out my scale. That way I know how much refrigerant I recover. And we can get pulling on this guy. So we open that guy up. Center that on there. And then we can turn this guy on. And now it's recovering. While I'm waiting for my technician to get here with the compressor, I'm doing everything I can. So I sanded everything up as best as I could. Sanded up the dryer area so we can cut it out. I'm unhooking the pressure control. I've got power turned off. We're just about done with the recovery. It's all about being efficient and moving through the entire process. We're not just gonna sit here and wait. We're gonna find something to do while we're waiting. All right. We are done with the recovery. I am uh, taking down all the recovery stuff. We're gonna use new refrigerant. We're gonna take that down, everything that I don't need. I need to get a new battery for my scale because it's going dead and the scale's acting wonky. So we're gonna go do that. I'm, my technician should be here any minute. I'm also gonna get the dryer, the copper materials I need and all that good stuff to get the compressor swapped out. All right, got my new compressor, got all the other materials. So what I'm gonna do is we're gonna start disassembling everything. We're gonna cut this guy right here. I've got a new bent piece, a new rotor lock valve. Get the compressor out, get the electrical disconnected. I taped off the pressure control wires because we are gonna have to energize eventually because we're gonna be flowing nitrogen as much as possible. So we gotta make sure everything's nice and safe, but we're gonna get disconnected first. All right, we've got the new compressor in. Now I gotta kinda do some prep work. I only wanna open it when I'm absolutely ready to open it because we keep the atmosphere out of there for as long as possible. So I'm just kinda prepping some things. Um, Get that ready, then we gotta do this piece and bend it. I'm gonna try to take a piece of pre-bent copper. Uh, we're currently, I got Robert over there taking the dryer out, cutting what I need so that way we can repipe it in. I went ahead and went with an actual Rotolock compressor. Hopefully that doesn't bite me in the butt because it is a little bit longer. It's very rare that you can find actual Rotolock compressors in my area. Um, so I was lucky enough to get this one. So it makes it a little bit easier because you don't gotta do that brass to steel fitting right here when you do an actual Rotolock compressor. All right, we've got uh, Sporlin Catch-All and Sporlin Seat-All. Now these are my favorite ones because this is a flare dryer with a male-female sight glass. You can see all these other ones that I've done. I really, really like those for the dryers, okay? Because usually when you have refrigerant leaks and issues, it's down at the evaporator coil. So you can pump the system down, do all the repairs you need down there, and you don't necessarily have to bring torches up to change the dryer, makes it really easy, okay? So I try to go back with flare on all my jobs whenever possible. You know, of course, there's sometimes I weld them in. And you can usually tell if I've recently worked on anything because flare, 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 you know? So that's how we do it. Try to make sure I, I get the threads nice and clean. Yeah. Then we're gonna take some dialog, just a little bit. the threads, thread this guy onto there, tighten it down. There's a copper gasket in there, you got to make sure it stays in there, you don't want to lose that. Alright, so we're good to go on that.
put the flare on there. The flare is what's messing me up, so I need to do the flare first. Because there's not enough room to slide the flare net down to make the flare. That's my problem.
shouldn't really have gloves unless they're leather. Because they'll catch on fire. So either use them or don't. But make sure they're leather. System C, and then turn the nitrogen on. Compressor is installed, tightened up, 
we've got the vacuum pump running on it. I've got a micron gauge over there. I'm gonna get working on putting the electrical on right now so we can turn on the power and open up all the solenoid valves. These uh, evaporator coils do have electric defrost, so the power's controlled from up here. So when the breaker's off, you know, the solenoid valves are closed, basically. All right, got the electrical hooked up. I just looked at my footage, found what color wires went where. We should be good. Crankcase heater hooked up. We're still evacuating. You can see little bits of bubbles coming out of the oil. I grounded out the crankcase heater. Everything is good. I'm gonna start siliconing these. Actually, I'm gonna wait till I take off all my stuff, but we're gonna put silicone on that, preventing it from ever rubbing out. Um, vacuum is actually at 470 microns, so that's pretty darn good. Um, yeah, we're looking good so far. So we're gonna get ready to uh, start this guy up here. Hopefully in just a few minutes, we're gonna go get some new refrigerant, dump this guy, uh, or put new refrigerant in this guy and hope that everything else works. Okay, we got the 404 hooked up. Um, I weighed it before, all, whenever you're using digital scales, especially the wireless ones, you always wanna write down. So the tank weighed 26, 12, 26 pounds, 12 ounces, just in case something happened because I was having weird battery issues. So what I did was I front seated the valve on the receiver so the gas cannot leave the receiver and we're just dumping it into the receiver. That way I can control the flow. So we're putting as much gas into the receiver and the condenser as I can. And then when I'm ready, I will open it up and let it flow down to the evaporators and then come back up and turn on at the pressure control. But you can see, I'm just putting it in on the high side and it's not coming up on the low side because of that. Now what we want to do too, Come over here, everything's on. The breakers right here are ready to go. And this is where I have it front seated. So I push that all the way down. So that way it's just dumping gas into the receiver and stacking it up. And then it's going into the condenser too. We're getting ready to open up the king valve on the other side. We got just under 10 pounds into the system. So now we're gonna let it flow through the system and it should come up and we're gonna listen for the compressor to make sure it's running in the right direction. Pretty sure it will be because, and you can see, now we're coming up. Once it hits like 30 PSI, 25 PSI, it should turn on. Everything's closed except for this one. We should turn on here, as long as nothing bad happens here. Hey, go stand by the breaker. It's running in the right direction. Sounds a lot quieter than it did before. So we're good, we're running, we're good. All right, so now we're gonna finish charging on the low side. Uh, we're gonna clear the sight glass and then add the flooded charge, but the manufacturer has done a good job of letting us know what the total system charge is on this. I've got a nameplate and it says 25.2 pounds of gas. So we're just gonna add the 25.2 and that accounts for the flooded charge also. So we're just adding refrigerant. Yep, still running, nothing funky going on. We have compression. So like I said, we're just gonna add gas until we get to 25.2. I don't even think I have enough gas in this tank, so we're probably gonna drain that guy. It's running, cold suction line coming back, hot discharge line leaving the compressor nice and quiet too. All right, so again, we're watching the sight glass, we're watching our high side pressure, and we're looking at that guy right there. You can see the sight glass is still flashing. That's the good thing about those big Sporland sea alls. So this is a big beer walk-in. Both evaporators are running, moving air. It's cooling down in here, but we still got to uh, finish charging it. That guy is tapped out. I got 20 pounds of gas out of it, but we're looking for 25.2. So I have another tech going to the supply house to get some more refrigerant. We thought we had some. Uh, sight glass is still slightly flashing. Let me let it focus there. So it's still slightly flashing. So we'll definitely uh, monitor it. Still waiting for my guy to get back. We do have a clear sight glass now. So at this point, everything that we would add is gonna be flooded charge. Um, so we're essentially, what, five or six pounds, five pounds shy. Um, I went ahead and just put dabs of silicone on those guys to keep them from vibrating. Back on here and then down in here so they're not gonna rub. It's not rubbing on the line. We got plenty of oil in the compressor. The other compressor had plenty of oil too, so, you know, who knows? We're gonna get the other one cut open and then we'll figure out what killed it. I suspect maybe 
I don't know. Like, I would have to guess. I, I was going to say copper plating causing bearing issues, but I don't know because this thing really hasn't been worked on very much. So who knows? We'll see once we cut it open. We're going to get the last five pounds in there. I've already got a pound. So we're going to just keep plugging it in. Got my extra refrigerant. I was trying to push it in by actuating the pressure control, but it was struggling too much. So I've actually got someone uh, downstairs propping the door open. So what we're going to do is uh, I'm going to actually uh, put this last bit of refrigerant in here. The box is already satisfied. I just had to have them prop the door open. I'm not going to insulate that last section. I'm going to leave it off. Um, because I find like it's mixed results, but I tend to find the valves rust out more when the insulation comes down. Notice that one's not as bad, but that one's really bad. So I've been tending to leave it back a couple inches and see, especially when they have rotolock valves. If they don't have rotolock valves, it's not so big of a deal. We're gonna do a leak search real quick. I'm using my electronic leak detector. I have it set on the most sensitive setting in this case, which is turbo. This is the field piece DR82. Pretty good leak detector. Um, if you're interested in purchasing them, you can get them from True Tech Tools. Uh, use my offer code Big Picture, get a eight percent discount on most of the items, and then I get a small commission from that. So, but in order to do the leak search on this, we needed to shut off the compressor when it had positive pressure on both sides, right? We don't want it to be pumped down, essentially, because if you try to do a leak search and you're looking on the low side and it's pumped down, you're not going to have very much gas. So I shut this compressor off when it was operating. Okay. So now we're just gonna go over where our braze joints are. Now, two ways you can see on this one, you have the numerical display and you have the lighted tip, which I really, really like about those. Just kind of run it through here. Run it through here. I'm looking at the tip, don't see any problems. Right on there, everything looks good. Here, here, no big deal, no big deal. That looks good around there looks good looks good don't see any problems there let's go over to the other side coming on over here just run around this king valve on the receiver nothing come around this guy nothing come around my flare nuts nothing again I'm listening and looking at the lighted tip uh, looks like we got something going on right there. So we might need to torque down on that flare nut a little bit. It might just be some nylog or something too. So we'll check on that. Let's uh, check this weld. Something's a little funky. It could have just been from vibrating. So I'm going to torque down on that flare nut real quick and see if that one goes away. It really wasn't that loose, but let's check it again. Nothing, nothing, nothing. And let me move it over to the other side. nothing nothing so I think we're good I'm not seeing anything she's a happy camper um, oh we gotta do this oh no I already did this one yeah yeah so that's everything we are leak free we're ready to turn this rack back on and like I said we're gonna give the customer the keys um, hopefully the next clip is me cutting that compressor open all right I'm getting ready to cut this guy open but already look at look at the inside like there's a bunch of like metallic debris nastiness in there i don't know what that is so that's not good already like look at all that in there there's a bunch of stuff going on so this guy's it had oil in it and it still has oil it's a little bit low but i don't think it's going to be a lack of oil issue so we're going to see we'll start it up this guy takes 64 ounces or 1.89 liters of oil I went ahead and pulled the oil sight glass, drained out as much as I could. I mean, it's not that far off. It really isn't. But this oil has a very metallic smell to it. It's not burnt refrigerant. It, it smells metallic to me. Now, there's a bunch of stuff floating around. That's just my container. My container wasn't very dirty. Um, the oil is, I mean, it... I don't know it's not broken down so I don't think it was a lack of oil issue 
Okay, I think that's where we're at on this. It's not a lack of oil issue. So now we're gonna get... All right, it took me a few minutes to kind of figure out. I knew there was some sort of an issue and it was like a metal on metal issue because the sound that this thing was making was just atrocious. It was just really loud, okay? I happen to have an identical compressor right here that I recently cut open. Uh, we had, a, I, I did a video on it where I literally just tore down a compressor that some of my employees changed. This one, and it's the exact same model number, exact same system, just at a different restaurant. Okay, so it's a Z, something Z30. Let's see if I can figure this out right here. ZB30 KCE, okay? So this is a ZB30 KCE, this is a ZB30 KCE. So I was kind of comparing, trying to figure out what was going on here. And here's what it is. If you look down inside of here, we have mechanical wear right here, okay? This piece, if you look, actually wore down this piece, right where my screwdriver's at, right there, okay? If we pop this out, you can actually see flip it over actually you can't see it from that end but there's damage right here where this was hitting something and we can compare it to this one this one doesn't have that same damage okay um, now where so so see how that rides right in there too you can see that it it's also damaged the top of this right here too so there was something going on in here that caused this i don't know if it was a lubrication issue that caused it but that noise more than likely was coming from in here now there's also some wear odd wear on here feels a little rough right in here um this right here there's a little something going on here too. So there was just some sort of a lubrication issue at one point. I don't know if it was an oil breakdown because this, no, this this oil's fine. It still has lubricity, lubri, I don't know how to say that. It still, uh, still has the consistency that oil should have. So I don't think it was an oil breakdown. Now we were a little bit shy on oil, but I don't think it was enough to cause an issue. Now we could have in the past had an oil return problem. See, I originally thought that what we were going to find and look, look at this too. Look at, look at the wear pattern right here compared to this one. Yeah, that's interesting, huh? Very, very interesting. And then look right here. Look at that compared to this one. Now remember this one was an electrical failure not a mechanical failure. So something was going on in here. Definitely rubbing where we shouldn't have been rubbing. You can definitely see in here. Don't really see any copper plating issues. Um, yeah, so that's interesting. But some sort of a mechanical failure. Now, remember this compressor was still running. It was just making a really loud noise and I talked the customer into replacing it before it became a problem. So we're still gonna be going back to the customer site. I don't know if I'll get it on film. But we're going to be going back, checking the evaporators. Um, what I was getting out a minute ago is I originally thought that our issue was going to end up being like um, because they have two evaporators that each have their own power switches and they're constantly turning them off. But it doesn't turn the temperature controller off. So what it does is it frosts up the coils. And I guess that could be part of the cause still because if we have low superheat coming back... Um, and then it's going to cause issues with lubrication. So I guess it's still possibly what could be going on. But I mean, it wasn't like a lack of oil really. So, all right, well, that's it. My curiosity has been satisfied. So I found this compressor, I don't know, a couple months ago. Maybe, a, yeah, a couple months ago, I think. Uh, this particular customer isn't doing routine maintenance at the moment. And I was there servicing something else. And when, you know, when I have the, I have a lot of customers that don't do maintenance anymore. So when I'm on site, when I have my employees on site, I encourage everybody, including myself, to open their eyes and ears and walk around and find issues. That way it doesn't turn into 911 emergencies on Friday evenings, right? Typical how that stuff works. So um, 
this one had been kind of bothering me and we were a little bit busy. So I really wasn't in, you know, trying to push the issue. But once we slowed down and had a little gap, I reached out to the customer and I said, Hey, been noticing this compressor has been progressively getting louder and louder. There's something internally going on with it. Um, I'd like the opportunity to go ahead and replace it before it becomes a problem. Okay. This particular customer, even though they don't do routine maintenance, the facilities team understands and appreciates that kind of stuff. They've told me several times, Hey, we, you know, they like it when I bring things up to them, even if they're not doing routine maintenance. Now, if they were doing a routine maintenance program, you know, they would expect us to find this stuff before it becomes a problem. But again, you know, corporate stuff happens and, you know, maintenance gets canceled for budget reasons and different things. And oftentimes, at least my experience with these issues is that the facilities department isn't the one that's canceling the, 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 the planned preventative maintenance kind of stuff. It's usually people higher than them within the corporate office. And in that, uh, the situation of this particular restaurant chain, that is what's going on. Facilities wants to go ahead and be proactive with problems because they understand, but oftentimes people above them you know, got to cut the budgets for whatever reasons, right? It's above our pay grade kind of a thing. So we brought this to their attention. They said, yeah, definitely get it done, right? So it was nice though, because it wasn't an emergency. It wasn't like a big deal. I was able to schedule a time where I had myself and another technician and we went out there and we replaced the compressor. It wasn't a big deal, pretty routine changing the compressor, trying to look at the big picture as usual, changing the dual pressure control because it had never been changed. We've changed every other one, just kind of using... Um, you know, that kind of reasoning, just looking at everything saying, Hey, you know what, this is going to be a problem. It had already drifted as in the pressure settings. Like if you have it set to cut out at 30 and, you know, cut in at 45 or whatever, I started to notice that, Hey, it wasn't quite hitting right there. You know, you have to adjust it here and there. And that tends to happen with the older pressure controls, you know, uh, the, the dial and the bellows and different things, they just don't react the way that they're supposed to. So, um, we went ahead and recovered the entire charge. I kind of discovered or discussed that in the video. Um, you know, I could have just swapped the compressor. It could have been a quick change out. Realistically, this entire job didn't take more than two guys. I think it was like five or six hours each. So it wasn't a big deal, right? And that includes getting everything up on the roof, picking up all the materials, all that stuff. So it wasn't a big deal. Went ahead and recovered the charge. That way we could do everything that I wanted to do proactively changed that suction service valve. Didn't see the need to change the discharge service valve. It wasn't leaking. I had one with me. I actually keep those in stock because I have quite a few of these racks and uh, sometimes the service valves, the rotolock valves are difficult to come by. So we actually keep them in stock. That way when we run into these issues for emergency replacements, we're not in a bind, right? Uh, I was kind of fortunate that I was able to find a rotolock compressor. In the past, rotolocks were readily available, the compressors, but lately, you know, you can buy rotolock adapters, they're little brass adapters. If you actually open up the Copeland Mobile app and you look up the model number of this compressor and then go to service parts, I think is what it is, uh, it actually has all the part numbers for the crankcase heater, if it has a DTC valve, um, all that different stuff. And then you can find the suction service valves, the, the rotolock adapters. So a rotolock adapter, basically, if the compressor is a normal, non rotolock compressor. It just has a sweat connection. It's a little brass adapter that you can put it in there and it basically makes it a rotolock compressor. So didn't have to use that in this situation because I was fortunate enough to be able to buy a actual rotolock compressor. So that made it a little bit easier. One less step we had to do. Uh, went ahead and replaced that dryer. Obviously you saw that I repiped it, rebent the line, made it look nice and clean and started it back up and everything seemed to be okay. No issues, actually already sent another technician out there, didn't find any issues with the evaporator superheat. I still kind of think that our problem might have something to do with the customer shutting off the individual evaporators, kind of like I had mentioned in the video. Uh, two evaporator coils downstairs and they both have power switches, but they don't interrupt the temperature controller power or the solenoid coil, coil power. It's just a weird situation. Uh, it is something that we can correct, and I did bring it to the customer's attention, but at this time, they want to try to work on their employees to stop shutting off the fans. They don't want me to rewire the evaporator coils at this time. We may have to do it in the future, but um, that's what I think caused some of our issues. It also is an older compressor. I want to say it was from the 04 area. Um, you know, certainly they should get more life out of that compressor, but you know, if it's being abused or, or running in weird situations, you know, where, you know, evaporators are being shut off, superheat's going really low. Yeah, certainly there's going to be some, you know, wear and, you know, as compressors get older, as they age, they tend to get louder and louder. That does happen. 
But in this situation, I went ahead and cut the compressor open. And really the only problems that I could see was just the mechanical wear. It might be explained that it was just the age of the compressor, um, but there was definitely some wear. Now I can't be 100% certain that that is what was causing the loud noise. Um, but you know, that's kind of my, that's the only thing that I could see that was going on with it was what you guys saw in the video. So, you know, it is what it is. I really do appreciate you guys making it to the end of the video. If you haven't already, please consider supporting the channel. The easiest way to support the channel is just watch the videos from beginning to end. That really is the easiest way. Um, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. That's another great thing to do. Um, if you want to support the channel in other means, you can simply, uh, uh, look in the show notes of the video. There's links for PayPal, Patreon, YouTube channel memberships. Um, a really cool way to support it if you want to do so is if you go to truetechtools.com and you use my offer code big picture on most items on their website, you get an 8% discount on checkout when you use my offer code again, big picture, one word. Uh, when you do that, I get a small commission from that purchase. So it doesn't cost you anything extra. I get a small commission. That's a great way to do so. Okay. But again, I can't stress enough. The easiest way to support this channel is literally watch the videos from beginning to end. I would highly encourage you if you enjoy the videos uh, to share them and help the channel to grow. That would be awesome. I really do appreciate you if you can do that. Um, yeah. And that is pretty much it. Okay. You know, I, I've talked about this a lot. Uh, and you know, I can't stress it enough that you just never know what other people are going through. So just remember to be kind to one another. Everything's so crazy right now. And it just seems like it's just getting worse and worse with people's attitudes. Um, social media in general, I think has a lot to do with it. Ironically, we're posting these videos on social media, but you know, that's how it goes. But uh, social media gives people this power that they think they're faceless and nameless. So they tend to just bash other people and you know, it, it's just, it's uncalled for. So I encourage everybody out there to just be kind to one another. It really does help. And you never know what someone's going through. So you could make their day the better, right? Again, thank you so very much. And uh, we will catch you on the next one. Okay.